Hi everyone and welcome back. This is episode three where I'll be highlighting an underrepresented person in STEM. For this episode we'll be taking it all the way to India and so I'll be highlighting the amazing physicist Satyendra Nath Bose. Bose was born in India in 1894 and he was an amazing student. He went on to do his bachelor's and master's in applied mathematics. After his master's, Bose then took up a position at the university as a research scholar in mathematics and physics. And this involved a lot of teaching, but also studying the scientific literature. During his time as a research scholar, Bose gained expert knowledge in a number of areas. This included thermodynamics and the theory of relativity. So basically all the stuff they talk about in the Big Bang Theory. Now, some years back, Albert Einstein, who is pretty much really famous among scientists and non-scientists as a really, really amazing physicist. Him and other physicists at the time were making amazing discoveries in physics, which basically was the beginning of what we call quantum physics. Now, I'm sure when I just said quantum physics, you were like, but bear with me here, it's actually really interesting. Bose's great discovery came while he was preparing a lecture for his students. He was trying to relate the law of radiation, so radiation such as light, to what we call the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. This distribution is basically a calculation which describes how atoms or molecules in a gas state behave. So this calculation basically states that um, atoms and molecules in a gas form tend to move quite freely in a container and don't tend to interact with each other, except for brief collisions where they would exchange energy with each other. Now from this diagram that I'm showing you, it's really important to note the difference in colours of these atoms and molecules. And this was the assumption made in this calculation, that the different atoms and molecules within this gas form are distinct and this is key because while this holds true for a lot of atoms and molecules this is not necessarily the case for what we call quantum particles now you might be asking yourself what is a quantum particle was well, basically the smallest physical particle that's involved in any interaction so if we take light for example this is what Bose was actually working on at the time light is basically an electromagnetic field and what we call a photon is a tiny bundle of this electromagnetic field and we therefore class it as the quantum particle of light. Now Bose was getting ready to give this lecture on the law of radiation but he couldn't for the life of him match how photons um, behave experimentally to this Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution which basically describes how atoms and molecules behave in a, in a gaseous form. Now if you remember I said that this calculation assumes that each particle within that container of gas is different. However, Bose did his calculations and basically treated each particle as being exactly the same. This formed the basis for what we call quantum statistics because we now know that these particles which um, follow Bose's calculations, which we call bosons after him, they have a certain type of spin and we characterize this spin in numbers. Because these certain particles, which we call bosons, have this whole number spin, it basically means that, let's take photons for example, identical photons do not repulse each other and so they can occupy the same energy state. Now just to clarify, particles can have different energy states. For example, at different temperatures, let's say at a lower temperature, a particle can have a lower energy state. At a higher temperature, a particle can have a higher energy state. An example of how Bose's calculations to describe bosons and how they behave in the real world can be seen through the use of atom lasers. Photons in atom lasers can occupy the same energy state because they are bosons. And so this means that in atom lasers, photons can be focused onto an extremely small bright spot. Bose sent his calculations, which is now known as Bose-Einstein statistics, to Einstein himself. Einstein agreed with Bose's calculations and actually expanded these calculations from their use on photons to atoms. This led to the prediction of what we call Bose-Einstein condensates. Um, an example of this is helium-4, which is the gas that makes your voice go really, really loud. 
helium-4 atoms contain two electrons, two protons, and two neutrons, and so it gives the whole atom an overall spin of zero. Because helium has a whole number spin, this means that the atoms act according to the Bose-Einstein statistics. And just to recap, this statistic states that certain particles, bosons, they can occupy the same energy state. So in the case of helium at room temperature, um, it acts as a normal gas. The atoms can occupy different energy states. However, when helium is cooled down to near what we call absolute zero, around two Kelvin, these helium atoms actually occupy the same lowest energy state. And what happens when they all occupy this energy state? You get what we call a superfluid. Now, superfluids are literally stuff that you see in the movies, like it's crazy and creepy as hell. This superfluid has zero friction. It can leak through containers. It defies gravity and so can crawl up walls. That to me is creepy as hell, it's cool as hell, and it's literally like some superhero type stuff. And this phenomenon could have only been predicted and tested because of Bose's calculations. Now, just to give a complete picture, there are quantum particles which don't act like bosons. These are called fermions. Now, remember how I said that boson particles have a whole number spin? Well, fermions have a half number spin. So this can be a half, one and a half, two and a half, and so on. And if we take electrons, for example, which are fermions, they have a half spin. So they spin either upwards or downwards. And because of this half number spin, it means that the same type of electrons, the two blue electrons, repulse each other. And because they repulse each other, it means that the same type of electrons cannot occupy the same energy state or same quantum state. This can be illustrated when we look at an oxygen atom. From this diagram, you can see that the electrons that are paired together in the same energy state are different colors. You will never get the same type of electrons paired together in the same energy state. These electrons and other fermions follow what we call the Pauli exclusion principle. Now let's finally talk about how Bose was recognised for this work. Well, first of all, the paper he wrote describing these calculations was rejected. Great! <laughs> it turns out the journal he sent this paper to didn't actually see the significance of this work. Hmm, interesting. So Bose sent this paper to Einstein um, and Einstein translated this paper to German and then submitted it to another journal um, under Bose's name. And once this paper had been published, it actually opened up quite a few doors for Bose. He was able to travel to Europe where he worked with Einstein as well as Marie Curie. And these were two people who received Nobel Prizes that we know very well. So naturally you might be thinking, well, did Bose get a Nobel Prize? The answer is no. He didn't. Now, he was nominated for a Nobel Prize in physics. However, someone on the Nobel committee didn't think that his work was worthy of a Nobel Prize. Ironically, seven Nobel Prizes have been awarded for research related to Bose's work. Very interesting. So in conclusion, I hope from this video that we're all a little less scared of physics and quantum statistics. But also, and more importantly, I hope that we're much more aware of the groundbreaking work that Bose did in physics. So with that, I'll end it here. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them below and I will refer you to a physicist who'd be able to answer them better than I can. And so with that, I'll see you soon. Bye.